Hey yo, what's up everyone? Today we'll be looking at the table of shoebread in the tabernacle of Moses. So here's the story in short. Man in the garden sins against God and then man is cast out of the garden. This is found in the book of Genesis. Now the book of Genesis is part of a collective of books called the Torah. And in the Torah we find the law of Moses. So um, these are the five primary books that Moses wrote. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These books are written by one author, and that author is attributed to be Moses. And so when you look at the book of Genesis, the key picture is the beginning of things. Things are beginning. And in the book of Genesis, we see the election of a nation through Abraham. So in the book of Genesis, there are four major characters. It is Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. They are four major characters. And in that, we are seeing the election of a nation. God is choosing for himself a nation. And in the book of Exodus, we are seeing the redemption of a nation. God is redeeming a nation out of Egypt. So there is a mass Exodus. And then after Exodus, we find Leviticus. And in the book of Leviticus, we have the sanctification of a nation. God is giving them the order of worship. Get the sanctification of a nation. And then we go to the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, we have the direction of a nation. God for 40 years, he is leading a nation through the wilderness. It is the, 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 the direction of a nation. There is a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day and then finally we have the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Deuteronomy we have the instruction of a nation because God is now repeating the law to them teaching them again the law and then it is a new generation which has been born from the wilderness which was not in Egypt and so we see in all this that um, there is a particular book we'll be focusing on and this, this book is Exodus and in Exodus, God comes and he speaks to Moses and he says, build for me a tabernacle that I may dwell among my people. So we see that God has a primary purpose for having this tabernacle. And God's reason for having a tabernacle is so that he can dwell among his people. So as we study and go into the riches and depth and truth concerning the tabernacle, we see a number of principles and a number of underlying truths which are critical and crucial for how harboring and enjoying the presence of God in our midst because God wanted to dwell among his people and then he said build for me a tabernacle so when you study and look at this tabernacle we'll be able to draw out certain truths which are necessary for our walk with the Lord and not only that particularly in the tabernacle of Moses we see the riches of redemption story we see the riches of redemption the story of redemption right there in the tabernacle of Moses I like referring to the tabernacle of Moses as the gospel according to Moses because when we look at the tabernacle we see the gospel being preached once we look at it retrospectively in view of the entire scriptures because in the volume of the book it is written of him to do the will of God so in there there are many riches there are so many gems of truth which men often overlooks and today we'll be looking particularly at the table of shoebread in the tabernacle of Moses as we study the tabernacle of Moses there are two ways of approach the first way of approach it is how man approaches the tabernacle which is from the brazen altar towards the most holy place and then the second approach it is God's perspective when God gave the instruction to build the tabernacle he first began with the inward and then went outward so God began first with the instruction of the ark of the covenant and then going outward so there are two approaches inward outward and then outward inward so with inward outward it is from the mercy seat to the outer court that is God's perspective and then you also have another perspective from the brazen altar to the most holy place this is man's approach so we see two approaches the first approach is God's approach from the mercy seat towards man this is grace this is God approaching man in grace because God makes the first move so God approaches us in grace already we are seeing a, a message of the gospel altogether so this is God's perspective this is God's revelation 
vision as he gives the revelation for building for him a tabernacle he begins first with the ark of the covenant which contains the mercy seat on top and this is God's approach to man God is going to approach man in revelation God is going to approach man in grace God is going to approach man in mercy this is God's perspective so we can study the tabernacle from God's perspective so with grace but also there is man's perspective man's approach when man approaches God he first begins at the brazen altar making a sacrifice and then by the faith he places on the sacrifice he has made he then moves on forward towards the holy place so we see the second approach it is man's approach and there is an approach of faith so God approaches man God makes the first move he approaches man in grace and then man makes the second move he responds and approaches God in faith so we are moved towards God in faith and God moves towards us in grace so those are primarily the two ways in which we can study the tabernacle of Moses and when you look at God's perspective and God's approach he begins by first by giving the instruction that build for me a tabernacle and then he says let there be an ark of the covenant so when you look at the tabernacle of Moses there were six articles of furniture we have the ark of the covenant we have the golden lampstand we have the golden altar of incense we have the table of shoe bread we have the brazen lava and we also have the the brazen altar so in total there are six articles of furniture and these are important and they, they stand out in the tabernacle of moses and today's today's emphasis it is on the table of shoe bread when god says build for me a tabernacle it had four sides we understand it was facing eastward and then we see that also the tabernacle it made a picture of the cross when you look at it geographically from the top it makes an image of the cross when they when, when, when are looking down on it so we see that on the eastern side there were three tribes and the tribes on the eastern side it was judah Issachar, and zebulun these ones they were on the eastern side and then on the southern side were three other tribes and the three tribes on the south it was ruben Sim and God. These ones, they were the tribes on the south. And then on the western side were three other tribes. And these tribes, it was Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh. These ones were on the west. And then on the northern side were three more tribes. We were Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. So these are the, are the 12 sons of Rachel. But there's one son missing, that is Levi. And then we see Levi had three sons, three primary sons, right? And who are these sons? It is Geshom, it is Kohath, and it is Merari and from the tribe of Levi who have no inheritance we have the priesthood and so we see that under Levi there is the priesthood right so on the eastern side the priests would be on the eastern side and then right on the sides were the three families of the Levites so we find that on the southern side we have we have the the Geshomites and then on the western side we have the Kohathites and then on the northern side we have Merari so those are the three sons of Levi and then in their orientations and then when you look at the tabernacle we will see that towards the east we have the brazen altar and the brazen lava towards the eastern side and towards the southern side we have the golden lampstand and right in the center we have the, the golden altar of incense and towards the north towards the west a bit we have the ark of the covenant and then on the northern side we have the table of shoe bread so the first thing we see that the table of shoe bread it was the second article of furniture when god was revealing the tabernacle he first revealed the ark of the covenant which symbolizes his presence and right immediately after that he gives an instruction for the table of shoe bread so the table of shoe bread it is the second article of furniture in the tabernacle of moses and the table of shoe bread it was found right there on 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 the northern side and it was in the holy place remember the tabernacle had three had three levels or three compartments we had the outer court and in the outer court you find the brazen lava and the brazen altar that was in the outer court and then in the inner court we find three articles of furniture it is the table of shoe bread it is the golden altar of incense and it is the golden lampstand these three they are right in the holy place and then in the most holy place there's only but one article of furniture and that article of furniture it is called the ark of the covenant of the lord of all the earth and so those are the articles of furniture and so the, the second article 
it is the tabernacle no, not the tabernacle it is the table of shoebread and so this is the first time we hear the mention of the word table in the Bible in the instruction and the revelation of the table of shoebread it is the very first time a, a table is mentioned in scripture and then there are many things we're gonna look regarding the, the first mention of the table right there and then we're going to open our Bibles in the book of Exodus chapter 25. We're going to look at our Bibles in the book of Exodus chapter 25. And so we see that on the table of shoe bread, particularly there was bread which was placed on it. And then this bread, it was eaten by the priest. So only the priest could partake of this bread. Only the priest could eat of this bread. And this bread, it was unleavened bread. It would be there for six days. And on the seventh day, the priest must eat it. Okay. So that is a general general overview so now when you look at this table it is pointing us to the lord jesus christ in his ministrations to the church and so the table of shoe bread is pointing us to the person of the lord jesus christ particularly in his ministration to the church okay it is pointing us to the person of the lord jesus christ in his ministrations to the church so let us read a verse exodus 25 verse 23 he says thou shalt also make a table okay let us just pause right there thou shalt also make a table so when god is giving an instruction he says i need a table in the in the tabernacle of the lord i need for there to be a table so in man in genesis or in the book of genesis we see the fall of man and subsequent to this fall was the break in communion so fellowship was broken when man fell fellowship was broken communion with god was broken when man fell remember in the garden in the genesis season god would come and commune with men in the cool of the day but since sin entered since men transgressed against god fellowship with god was broken man was cast out of the, the garden judgment was laid on the serpent and then and then god made certain decrees upon mankind and then the earth was cursed for the sake of man he cursed the serpent he cursed the earth but man was not cursed but man had to suffer the consequences of his own action and one of those consequences is that now fellowship with god is now broken and so now god therefore makes an instruction to moses in the redemption of men and when god says unto moses i want you to build for me a table so god is now looking for a table and the purpose for god for having a table is so they can restore the severed lines of communication to to, to restore to restore men unto grace a brother by grace restoring men unto him so that he can now be free to fellowship with men once more so we see a preparation god has made for men to come and and fellowship with him so in this table we see that actually in christ god has prepared a table for his for his redeemed to come and partake of so there is a table in christ which has been set for you and i to come and partake of so now we are his, his redeemed people we are the priests of his sanctuary remember that the new testament says it says we are a royal priesthood a holy nation so we are a royal priesthood only the priests could partake of the bread on the table so in Christ there is a table which has been prepared whereby you and I can freely eat so we see that this table it was not Moses idea Moses did not have an idea say so you know what um we could have a nice decoration right here in the tabernacle hmm? like a nice decoration right here in the tabernacle whereby we can come and and then sit right at the, the, the table that was not the case rather god had an instruction he gave it to, to moses so the table the tabernacle all these things they were not man's idea but they were divine revelation so we have to understand that god divinely revealed the concept of the table of shoe bread it was god's revelation not man's idea it was placed on the northern side of the tabernacle so it was directly opposite the golden lampstand so it will take the light coming from the table it will take the light coming from the 
golden lampstand to illuminate the ministry on the table. So you cannot eat on the table, you cannot eat on the table without light because it is dark. So on the outer court, we had sun, we had sunlight coming in, it was natural light. And then in the holy place, it was dark. So the only source of light was the golden lampstand, that is artificial light. And then in the most holy place, it was even darker. And in the most holy place, there was no artificial light, there was no natural light. But God himself in his glory was the light. In the Shekinah glory was the light right there. The, that brightness, that radiance which was oozing from it, from the ark. That was the natural, that was the light which was naturally occurring right there in the holy place. So this is a supernatural light. So in the outer court, natural light. In the holy place, artificial light. In the most holy place, a supernatural light. And so it will take the light from the candlestick to illuminate the ministry on the table. So when you look at the table, it is symbolic of the word, right? Because that's where you find the shoe bread, the bread of life. You know, it is symbolic. It's a picture of the word. Whereby we come and fellowship with God in the scriptures. Whereby we come and we fellowship with God in the word. But before we fellowship in the word, we need the light from the lampstand. And the lampstand is symbolic of the Holy Ghost. So it will take illumination from the Holy Ghost in order to properly understand the, the scriptures. So our ministry at the table of Shubred, our ministry of the word is highly dependent upon the illumination of the spirit. You have to understand that it was the Holy Spirit who inspired the scriptures. So when you look at the Bible, there are over 66 books in the Bible. The word Bible from the Greek word Biblios, meaning library. So the Bible is a compilation of a number of books. And these books were written in a period of over one 1,400 years by over 40 different writers, but the author is one, because the Holy Ghost is the author. First Peter, First Peter tells us, it says that a holy man, it says scriptures came not in time past by the slight of men, but the holy men of God wrote as the Holy Spirit moved them. So holy men of God were moved by the Spirit to write the things that they were written. And Paul tells us in, in Timothy 3, 16. It said the scriptures are, 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 are by the inspiration of God. And this is where I want to draw attention to. In the scriptures, we see two things God directly breathed upon. In Genesis, God breathed upon man and man became a living soul. And then in the book of Timothy, Paul tells us, he said the scriptures are God breathed. So in the Bible, we see two things God has breathed upon. Firstly, it is man. God breathed into man the breath of life. And then God breathed out the scriptures. So the scriptures are the scriptures are God breathed. So in this we see a, a wonderful picture that it will take the breath of God in us to understand the breath of God in the scriptures. So it takes the light from the candlestick to understand the ministry at the table. We cannot adequately interpret the scriptures without the writer of the scriptures. So the writer is also the divine interpreter. The divine writer, the divine author is also the divine interpreter. In fact, scripture is its own interpreter. Is it in, it in, in own interpreter? So it is so wonderful, it's so blessed, it is so awesome. And I want us to go into these mysteries today in the table of Shubra. It says, You shall build for me a table. So when you look at this table, it's a picture of the Lord's table. When we study our Bibles in the book of 1 Corinthians, in the book of 1 Corinthians 10. It is it is it is called the Lord's table. First Corinthians ten. It is the Lord's table, and in First Corinthians ten, we see Holy Communion. God speaking about communion, about the bread and the wine, about the body and the blood. He calls it the Lord's table. So, in the table of shewbread, we are seeing in picture the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are seeing a picture of the cross. We are seeing a picture of the sufferings of Calvary. We are seeing a picture of the agony the Son went through right there on the table, right there on the table, and we will get into that, and then we will show that through the scriptures. So we're going to take a journey throughout the scriptures, and we're going to read a number of them just to see how all these things unfold, and hopefully we will have the illumination of God, and then see all the wonderful things of God's law that he has written for us in the scriptures. And so I'd like us to read body. 
for we are all partakers of that one bread. Did you see that? For we being many are one bread and partakers of one body. For we have all partaken of that bread. So we being many are one bread. So we being many are one bread. So we see that on the table of shoe bread, there were 12 loaves of bread in two piles. A pile of six and another pile of six, 12 loaves of bread. And then six is the number of men because man was made on the sixth day, right? Six is the number of men, okay? So we have two pillars of bread. So in one pillar, we are seeing mankind. In another pillar, we are seeing our mediator, the Lord Jesus. So we see God meeting with man because in this fellowship, he came in the form of a man to connect with us, to meet with us, to fellowship with us, to commune with us right there at the table of shoe bread. Right there. So we being many are but one, one bread. So the Bible tells us, it says he prepares a table for us in the presence of our enemies. In the presence of our enemies. So in the table, we are seeing the new covenant. So in the table of shoe bread, we see the new covenant of the Lord. In the table, or in the table of shoe bread, we are seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministrations to, to, to the church. In the table of shoe bread, we are seeing the communion table, the body and the blood. In the table of shoe bread, we are also seeing the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the table of shoe bread, we are seeing God's fellowship with men. God wants to restore fellowship with men right there at the table of shoe bread. And then thou shalt make a table for me. Right, Exodus 25, verse 23. Thou shalt make a table for me of shittim wood. Here is an important aspect. And I, I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Thou shalt make for me a table of shittim wood. So the table was completely made of shittim wood. When you speak of shittim wood, shittim wood is acacia wood. In the Septuagint, it is rendered as incorruptible wood. So when you look at shitty wood, we are, we are seeing the incorruptible humanity of the Son. The incorruptible humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it speaks of Him coming in His humanity, growing up out of the earth. You see, so it speaks of the Lord Jesus in his humanity. And we're going to go through scriptures to prove that. It speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity coming up from the earth. Right? In his humanity coming up from the earth, growing up from the earth. Shitting wood, just like shitting wood grows from the earth. We are seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in his humanity. It is rendered as incorruptible woods. We see the Lord Jesus in his incorruptible humanity. And what do you mean by his incorruptible humanity? Because he was not corrupted by sin. His body did not decay. His body did not see any corruption. We see that the Lord Jesus, he was perfect in his humanity. He was sinless. There was no sin which could be found in him. So this is the sinlessness of the Son. The sinlessness of the Son. This is shitty wood. And so, let us have a few verses, right? Let us have a few verses whereby we can look deeper and delve in deeper into this thing. Isaiah 53 verse 2. It says, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. For he has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So, do you, see, do you see that? It says, he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. So, in Isaiah 53, that great messas, messianic chapter, which speaks of the Messiah in his sufferings, it says, he shall grow up as a tender plant. So, a tender plant symbolizing him. He shall grow up as a tender plant. And as a root out of dry ground, shit wood grew in the desert places, in the dry places. That's where it grew. It was like a shrub growing right there. So in this, we are seeing a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall grow up as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Let us visit uh, Psalms chapter 16, verse 10. Another witness. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. So we see that once the son died for our sins, uh, 
his body did not see any corruption none was his body did not decay his body did not see any corruption incorruptible wood just like shit wood incorruptible there was no corruption which was found in him in his death there was no corruption in his life there was no corruption in his resurrection there is no corruption he knows no sin he knows no corruption the bible says he who knew no sin he does not know sin at all he did not sin whatsoever um, so it is incorruptible wood right uh, god came to move to to noah and he says to noah build for me build for me an ark build for me an ark says god unto noah and then this ark it was to be made out of gopher wood so we find an ark made out of gopher wood and gopher wood it is unsinkable wood it is unsinkable wood so this is also speaking to us of the lord jesus christ how he could not be sunk how death was not able to hold him he could not sink it is unsinkable wood and so he so gopher wood when you, when you push it into the water it is buoyant it bounces back up again this is speaking of the sun how it's going to defeat the waters of death and bounce back up again unsinkable so this is the sun in its incorruptible humanity the bible says the book of first peter chapter 1 verse 3 verse 23 it says being born again not out of corruptible seed but of the uh, but out of the incorruptible seed of the word of god which abideth forever so we're not born out of the corruptible seed but we're born out of an incorruptible seed that is the seed of the word of god which abides forever when you look at first john chapter 3 verse 5 it says and you know that he was manifested to take away our sins and in him is no sin in him is no sin he was taken away he was manifested to take away our sins and in him there is no sin this is his incorruptibility there is no sin in him whatsoever that's why he was manifested that he can take away our sins so you can fellowship with him again at the table so he is sinless in his humanity uh, let us also look at a, at a few more witnesses Isaiah chapter 4 verse 2 we are just taking a journey through the scriptures Isaiah chapter 4 verse 2 it says in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel you see that just that first part in that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious so there is the branch of the lord that is the lord jesus christ he's the branch of the lord jeremiah 23 verse 5 behold the days come saith the lord that i will raise unto david a righteous branch so the lord says i will raise unto david a righteous branch zechariah chapter 3 verse 8 here now O joshua the high priest thou and thy fellows that sit before thee for there are men wondered at behold i will bring forth my servant the branch i'll bring forth my servant the branch zachariah 6 verse 12 and speak unto him saying thus speaketh the lord of hosts saying behold the man whose name is the branch and he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of the lord there's the Quran 6 12. behold the name behold the man whose name is the branch and he shall build the tabernacle of the lord this is speaking of the lord jesus christ as we saw through a plethora of verses through a plethora of verses whereby the lord jesus is sinless he's incorruptible he was not corrupted he knew no corruption he was sinless he was called the branch he's called the branch throughout the scripture in the book of john he says i'm the vine you are the branches as well how how, how awesome and how wonderful is that so in this shitty mood it's a picture of the humanity of the son because he came he came as man he became man you know and when he became man when he was incarnated he he was completely man he had a completely natural life you understand he had a completely natural life so he can die for our sins though he was god he became man he emptied himself of all his divine attributes right and then he became man 
and he walked here on earth and he was completely sinless. He was the seed of the woman. So in the table of Shubred, we are seeing a picture of how God will then now want to restore fellowship which has now been broken. God wants to restore it. And as you look at the table of Shubred, there are many things to touch on this and we will do so in subsequent videos. But there is this thought I want us to part with today. Here is a parting thought. On the table of Shubred, we find that on this table, there was no chair. On the table of Shubred, there were, there were, there were dishes. There, was, there were dishes, dishes and spoons, vessels to minister right there at the table, right for the meat offering and the drink offering, right there at the table of Shubred. But there were no chairs at this table. So the priests, as they were ministering, they would minister standing. They never got to sit. Right? They would minister standing. Okay? That is speaking to us about how the law was only temporary. It never brought rest. Men always had to work. Men always had to toil. Okay? And then comes grace. And then when you look at this, there are actually two other seats actually there are two other seats we find in the most holy place is the mercy seat right it's a mercy seat where the blood was sprinkled once a year on the day of, on the day of atonement the mercy seat it's mercy seat where god shows us mercy the throne of grace mercy seat and then right in the outer court we find the brazen altar which had a grate on top so the brazen altar is very much similar to the to the ark of the covenant because they both had lids right the lid the lid on the ark of the covenant is called the mercy seat and the lid on the brazen altar is called the great the brazen great and then on the great you are seeing a picture of the judgment seat because on the brazen altar that's where sin was judged bronze speaks of judgment against sin because bronze is brass right bronze brass it has a, a, an ability to endure fires that's why all fires were made right there at the brazen altar whereby they would burn all sacrifices it was able to endure the fire it was made of brass so this is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, how he was able to endure the fires of God's wrath and judgment upon sin. So he took in all the judgment for us. It was made of brass. So we see at the brazen altar, we are seeing the judgment seat, sin being judged. And then we see at the, at the Ark of the Covenant, a mercy seat, God giving mercy. So there are two seats in the outer court and in the most holy place. And in the holy place the inner court we are seeing a table with no chairs so in this we are seeing an awesome prophetic picture of two chairs so god allows man to sit on the mercy seat so that he so that man can receive mercy from god and then the son sitting on the judgment seat so that he can take our place so in this we are seeing substitution so actually there are two chairs right and then they are coming together in the person of the lord jesus christ that's why jesus when he was on the cross he was not on earth he was also not in heaven he was suspended mid-air on the cross so he was a mediator between god and man he was mediating between the between two right he was the umpire he was the days man that is the lord jesus christ and then when you're looking at this we are seeing how uh, the bible tells us in the book of first uh, timothy 2 5 that there's only one mediator between god and man the man jesus christ so the lord jesus christ he is the mediator between god and man so the lord jesus mediating between god and man he allows us to come together by his gracious sacrifice and so in the table of shoe bread we are seeing that god is restoring communion it's a picture of the gospel about how god will then begin to restore communion with man the table of shoe bread it had four feet it's a picture of the four gospels it needed four feet so that it can be balanced if four is a picture of the earth it's a picture of creation uh, north, west, east, and south. The four cardinal points, the four seasons, uh, autumn, winter, summer, spring, the four seasons, you understand? Uh, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. 
and uh, the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 8 he says you shall be my witnesses beginning in Jerusalem Judea Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth where the gospel must touch so we are seeing in the four feet of the table of shoe bread in the four feet we are seeing a picture of the four gospels and they are both necessary because it is in the gospels that the humanity of the son is upheld it is the gospels which upheld the person and the ministry and the life of the Lord Jesus Christ so this is speaking about how our gospel needs to be balanced because we need to present a balanced picture of the Lord Jesus Christ in our administration of the gospel to the entire world so we need balance balance is necessary and balance is important in our administration of the gospel uh, thank you so much for joining in if you enjoyed this video smash that like button smash the subscribe button smash the bell icon so you can get our latest notifications thank you for tuning in see you all next time bless you